Our team name was Muggles United because there was a lot of fuss about some magic within the data. And so we thought that might be a fitting name. Hi there. Welcome to the winner's call for the Tweet Sentiment competition. Um, this is Maggie Demkin from Kaggle. I work on the competitions team and I'm going to um, introduce Phil as well and then we'll turn it over to the host. I'm Phil. I'm a data scientist on the competitions team and I'm really excited to see what you two have pulled off for this. This looks really interesting. So my name is Christoph. I have a PhD in mathematics to be more precise in probability theory and stochastic processes. I work at uh, NVIDIA as a data scientist. I'm Khoi Nguyen. Uh, I'm a data scientist at VNG Corporation uh, in uh, Ho Chi Minh City of Vietnam. I'm glad to be here. So our solution is, um, let's call it a simple ensemble of different uh, transformers, um, different transformer backbones, namely based on Roberta base and Roberta large and also Bart large. What gave us the push to the top positions was um, two different um, modeling approaches, um, which each of uh, us um, developed individually. So my model has um, a specific head that um, accounts for character level prediction, which we will see is quite important for this competition. And Koi's model uses a beam search head to leverage more from the uh, spam predictions by conditioning on the on the start token. We heavily relied on the hugging face repository and uh, used PyTorch. What is different is that Koi used rather Python scripts, where I as I, I rather used Jupyter notebooks. So it was easier for us then to work more or less individually because we had like different different setups. How the competition went for us overall, Koi already started like weeks before me. There was a lot of changes in the beginning related to the competition metric, related to cleaning the data again. So the data was a little bit changed and Koi handled that very, very well. And when I, I joined the competition, he was on, on first place already. I joined the competition and I normally set up a very simple baseline. And then I was a little bit isolated and I wanted to, to have um, discussions with someone who already is like deep into the competition. So I went through um, the leaderboard to see how, who is, is participating. And I saw Koi at one of the top spots and I already had like a good, and I never teamed with him before, but I believe that he was quite an active and and good competitors so i asked him to to join forces and he he accepted the competition was quite hard i would say because right from the beginning there was a very strong public notebook and it was really hard to beat um, other competitors so we tried like so many things that in the middle of the competitions we needed like a break and um, luckily this was the same time for both of us so we we took like kind of a, a one month break and that changed during the last two weeks two or three weeks of the competitions i would say when there was a very famous um, discussion post about some some magic in the data that might enable to yeah to make a difference in in the in the set of all competitors so koi has a a working station which has like eight um, GeForce uh, 2080 Ti and I have an, a DGX workstation which has like four V100 and although the competition data was quite small compared to other NLP competitions especially our cross-validation setup made it um, important to have some resources so what we did is we did a simple five-fold uh, cross-validation but we saw there's a lot of variance in in the outcomes and a lot of variance on the on the public leaderboard um, and even when changing simple seed of the fivefold we get like very different results um, and that bugged us a lot in the in the beginning and then we decided to rely more on a, on a begging approach so we still do fivefold but we do for different seeds so we get a more reliable cross validation which was quite important because when the baseline, the public baseline is already so strong, you only make like very small steps in your, in your score. And to judge if a step is like pure noise or coming from a real improvement, you need a, a stable, a stable setup and running 
like the three bags for each fivefold um, really helped in, in getting a more reliable feedback from our cross-validation. Additionally, um, we neither used early stopping nor any checkpointing to avoid uh, overfitting on our validation set. And even in our, in our final submission, submission, we bagged all models we had with five different seeds. During the experiments in the competition, we also um, tried nested K-folds. So we, we took like a different um, holdout set and run um, with, the, with the training data, then a K-fold scheme to simulate how uh, much variance is in the in the leaderboard set. So um, now in more details to our solution itself, it was quite critical to um, handle what people call noise in the data, but it's rather like a, a property how people labeled um, the data. And the, the most important thing is that you either enable the model or the tokenizer to somehow predict the the labels which were actually given. So a good example is um, this I like it uh, sentence. The label might be just I like it with like one exclamation mark, but um, with the normal uh, tokenization we used, that would never be possible to predict because the tokenizer will always bundle all exclamation marks in one in one token. So what we did is um, we manually adjusted the tokenizer to not split um, punctuations. And that already helped a lot. And then there were also more, yeah, let's call them corrupted labels. And we used um, fuzzy matching to match our predictions which, uh, with um, possible, possible labels. That's all related to the non-character model, which was on, on word or, or token level. For the character model, you don't need to do any pre-processing at all because you can really take the character span positions which were in the labels. So you don't need to do any pre-processing. In fact, pre-processing even hurts um, the model then. So the to best is then just to take the, the text input as it was. So we had two models, which one was on, on token level, one was on character level, and luckily, um, both assembled really well, although they're quite um, different from the head, I would say, from the model head. Still, the backbone is um, where the same, like the three, Roberta, Bayes, Large, and Bart. Um, and also the overall hyperparameters, we are quite, quite similar. So we use the linear decay learning rate schedule. We use the um, initial learning rate of two e minus five, and we use the Adam W optimizers. And then we trained for um, the word model a little bit longer for four epochs um, with one warm up um, epoch where we froze um, the backbone. Um, and the character model we trained a little bit less because you have way more free and newly initialized um, parameters. The model tends to overfit way faster. And for both, we um, removed impossible predictions at the end. So when you predict the the text, you basically have like um, paddings and classification tokens and that kind of stuff. And it, of course, it doesn't make sense to use that as a prediction. So um, we force the model to only make, let's say, meaningful, meaningful predictions. The character model I use, that's um, one Overall picture, but I will go more into detail. I start from bottom to, to top is the, the progress. Having the normal text, you use the, the tokenizer to tokenize the text. And what is very important for this competition is that you keep um, spaces and any punctuation. So as you can see here, and that's actually a real example from the data set, the spaces between home now and gonna are um, still in the tokenized version. Then you have the, the tokens you put into the, the transformer, which in this case would be a Roberta. And then for each token, you get a context representation. So for each token, you get a 268 dimensional vector, which um, contains information about the token, but also um, information about how the token interact with other tokens. And that alone is not enough in this case to predict the label, which was honor in, in, in this case. So there were like 10% or 15%, let's call them corrupted labels, where 
um, despite the, the other 90%, it's not able to predict this by a token-based approach. So using the tokenized text at the, at the input, you will never be able to predict the actual label. So it is was quite one, one solution, and my, my model is based on that, is to enable the model somehow to predict on a character um, on a character level. So, and I thought about like many ways how to do that. And the first one that came to my mind is to replicate each um, hidden representation for each token as often as the, the token has characters so that I get a character-based representation. And that's what, what this step does. So I replicate each hidden state as often as the original token had characters. Um, and then all these representations have like equal values at this point. So I need to model again interaction between the characters. And I do that by having a four layer um, RNN network um, and then project that with the last linear layer down to a single logit, which en enables to to predict the start and the the end token. When you replicate the characters, of course, you will have a bigger size than just by the tokens, and you also need to handle padding and and that kind of stuff here. Luckily, the data was based on tweets, and the tweets had have like a character limit, so we also use the same character limit as a, a maximum length for our uh, character predictions. And um, what I also had not mentioned yet is that I had two parallel heads for the the start token or the start character and the end character. So this four layer um, RNN is done for the start token and for the, the end um, character. And then um, Koi's model was like quite different. It was um, token based and used um, the beam search algorithm which was luckily already implemented in the Hagging Phase repository, but not as um, obvious as other model components because it was somehow hidden in the XLNet decoder head. So you needed to search a little bit to find this idea and how that works, but it uh, quite nicely also applies to any other backbone. So what, um, Coit um, did this use the, the XL node decoder head, which um, originally is used for the squad um, data set, and yeah, used it for our use case here. The idea of, of the beam search mainly is to not predict the start and the end um, span independently, but to condition the end prediction based on what your model thinks is the start. Which makes sense, which makes sense, of course. So the idea is that you, you predict the start index normally. So you have your normal backbone, transformer backbone. You have like a head, which predicts the, the start token. And then you also use that information for predicting, um, the end token, token index. And you do that by feeding the, the start token representation, which the model thinks is a, uh, a meaningful start token and you can choose how many possible start tokens the model considers and then concatenate that um, with the hidden representation of each token to predict the the end token index yeah and for inference um, you basically do the same you first predict the start um, token and then take the top k we experiment with different k values i guess at the end we took a K of five. So we took the five most uh, probable start um, hidden states and added those to the um, end token hidden state to predict a meaningful end token. Yeah, and then you get um, logits for each um, started end token. And what I mentioned before is that you then um, sort out those which which doesn't make any sense so it doesn't make any sense to have like classification token as a prediction it doesn't make sense to have padding tokens as a prediction um, but it also doesn't make sense to have a start token which is larger than the the end token for example and we yeah we wrote a simple function that goes through all possible pairs and just take um, a pair into consideration if it if it makes sense 
so to say. And then over all pairs that makes sense from a meaningful perspective, we take the, the one which has like the maximum joint probability and select that as the final, final prediction. Assembling is also quite interesting because we had two different approaches which we mixed. I assembled all my models on a logit level. So I needed, needed to be careful that they all match well. So you need to have like the same maximum length and the same character to token mappings and all that kind of stuff. So the, the logits have the same dimensions, but then you can just average the logits before getting the text from, from the logits. Koi, on the other hand, he assembled on a text level. So he predicted all the way through from his models to text. He had like, um, then for each, um, for each seed and each backbone, he had like the, the predicted text already and then assembled all those predicted texts by expected jacquard. So you do like a grid search over the whole possible input text and take the span which has the highest overlap with your with your predictions which is quite exhaustive because you you basically do a grid search over the full input text for each for each um, sample you want to predict and then how we assembled our both yeah our both sub ensembles so to say is that my character model was especially especially designed to handle like corrupted um, labels or corrupted text which you could somehow identify by consecutive spaces so whenever there was a consecutive space in the training data it was very likely that there was something something sketchy with the label so what we used my character model for all the sketchy samples and um, a mean of my and um, Coy's model for all other examples. And that that performed um, quite well at the end. What did not work were different um, other backgrounds. We basically tried all which are in the Hugging Face repository or all popular ones. So BERT, uh, Electra, XLNet, T5, GPT-2. Neither of them worked. Um, most likely due to their tokenizer. Um, so for example, the bird tokenizer forgets, so to say, consecutive spaces. It just like strips all consecutive spaces and loses that information. I try to manually adjust the bird tokenizer to, to consider consecutive spaces, but still the bird model was way worse than than the Roberta on BART we used. Um, we also tried BART base transformer, which was not in the Hugging Face re repository. I don't know if it's yet. I converted from the uh, from the Facebook um, repository um, and it was okay. Didn't add too much to our ensemble and given that the um, it was um, kernel only prediction, we had some time constraints and we, we took our three three top performing performing models at the end. What also didn't work were any fancy heads related to the um, word level model, using more layers, using RNN, um, using convolutional layers at the very end. All that stuff was worse than, than the, the head we had and especially worse than the beam search um, had we implemented. The only fancy thing is the character model, which was working and i guess it only worked because it was able to handle like this this uh, corrupted labels we also tried to do um, pseudo labeling but also that didn't give any 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 improvement and um what i also tried for the character model was like different ways how to model the the character interaction um so i tried and i thought that the transformer based um interaction would be more naturally not near natural when the when the backbone is a transformer but that didn't work very well and the same for a convolutional layer so the rnn by far um, worked best for the character interaction i mean the, the most important and interesting finding we had in the in the competition was that you need to enable your model to yeah to actually predict the target because just looking at the raw data so the the raw data and the labels most of the or none of the the models you can use or the backbones you use will enable to to predict the selected target which you which you had so you you had to find a way to either enable the model to do a character wise prediction or to use some and I guess that's what the other top teams did. Use some fancy post-processing method to shift, shift the labels or so. That is a really cool solution. 
I, when we were building this data, I knew that it was going to be really difficult <laughs> and, and kind of like, I knew that our, our labeling approach was going to be noisy and I knew we had noisy labels. I mean, that's NLP, right? Like noisy labels are basically the only constant in NLP problems, um, apart from you've got text, but that the, the ensembling of the character model, like, I love the, that you used a character model. That's amazing. Apart from like, have you done any work with character models before? Or was this, well, apart from, you know, I know there was a character model that came out a few years ago that was really like, I don't know, I played with it. So, but is there precedent for this for you? Or was this just like, you saw the, the data and realized that you needed one and, and went with it? I used some character model, let's say, let's call it back in the day when there was no transformers around and uh, mm -hmm. rather LSTMs. So um, I did an, an LSTM on character once in a project at, at work. Um, where I did um, speech to text and speech to text normally you need like a character wise um, prediction but I never the, the very challenging thing here was to use the information contained in a word level transformer but still be able to do a character wise prediction that was really the tough the tough challenge here that was the the first time I tried something like this so to to come from a word level to a character level somehow. And I tried different approaches. First thing I tried was to concatenate the hidden state of each token with like a one hot token, which tells me how, how long the token is basically. But also that didn't work. And the replicating thing really worked. So I tried like a bunch of stuff um, and that was the only thing that, that worked really well. That's really brilliant. Like how, so my, my like the intuition and I, one of my mentors in NLP told me, uh, if it's intuitive, it's probably wrong. But my <laughs> intuition, looking at the character model, is that you know, if you're if you're basically like de kind of decomposing it post after the embedding creation, you're you're taking it and I guess maybe not even decomposing, but expanding it so that you've got a you know that same vector for every that same embedding for every character in a token. I'm wondering. I'm just trying to think through like what kind of work is the, there was an RNN layer after that, right? Um, yeah. Okay, what, what, yeah. What, what's that doing? Because <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> it's it's so interesting. I'm trying to, I'm just trying to like think through the mechanics of what that, like obviously it enables the, you know, character level predictions, right? So that that's like key there, but that RNN, I'm just like thinking like, what is that RNN actually doing in terms of like working through the space of, of what you've got? when you have the replicated embeddings. I, I'm so fascinated by that. What's your what's your intuition on that? <laughs> to not, not to overload the word intuition, but yeah, what, what's your thought on that? I think the most important thing is, or the what we also tried as, as humans, as, as other teams did like in the post-processing, is to somehow derive a rule from the amount of consecutive spaces to the shift in the label. So the, the labels were and that we already um, found out that the labels were shifted by a specific um, number. Mm -hmm. So the labeler, he labeled the sentence, but then afterwards he deleted some content like smileys or retweet um, mentions or that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and by this he introduced um, spaces in the, in the text um, and that shifted basically the label. And then the label, so he, you, you had like the the character position of the label, um, but then you had a different text to which which you applied that because the text had been clean afterwards. And that um, led to this um, corrupted labels basically. And we already saw that somehow you can derive some kind of rule from the amount of consecutive spaces, but we as human, we're not <laughs> intelligent enough to come up with the with the rule. And I saw that even on a token level model, it tries to to shift the words a little bit. So in the example which I presented, there was something like "I gonna miss you," blah blah. Mm -hmm. And we know that the label should be miss, and the model already predicted the token gonna, which is, in our opinion, of course, wrong. But it um, was closer to the label than than the then what would make sense to us and and that's the point where i knew that the model somehow is capable to to get like this rule working and we just need to enable it to work on a more character level 
So back, coming back to your question, what I think the model does is somehow interaction of characters between a word, realize if it makes sense to put like the end, uh, the, be the, the start character of the word or something in the middle. To, put some, to use something in the middle of a word is somehow derived from the amount of consecutive spaces before or around the word. That, that's what I think is going on in this four RNN layers. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. That's, that's super cool. What a neat idea. I, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm glad it worked too. And then uh, Koi, so you're, it sounded like the, like the exhaustive text thing, the exhaustive text search, can you, Go into yeah. a little more detail about what that was doing, how that worked. I, I felt like I got it, and then afterwards I was like, maybe I don't got it. So I'll ask. So how did how did that work? I think it's very easy. Get a new tool for me, and so basically you want like uh, um, because um, the like, um, labels are very subjective. So you want kind of an, a medium. So um, what I just did, uh, I got all of the candidates from both model. And I find one with the best medium of, to all the, of those candidates, like a safe, a safe solution. So I think it's overall the best. That's the, that's the intuition. Interesting. Yeah, I, I, the, I mean, you know, there's the, there's the sort of clear stuff that you want to do when you're like teaming up in competitions, which is like, make sure you're all doing the same CV. And it, finding a stable CV was a, very good. <laughs> um, that's, that's not always easy, right? Um, but. Yeah, we spend a lot of amount on this, actually. Yeah, right. <laughs> now, now it looks easy, yeah, you just do like fivefold and, and beg a few yeah. times, but the, the road to that was quite um, yeah, challenging. Yeah, <laughs> that's that's a tough road. Yeah. No, congrats on I mean that's that's a, congratulations on finding a, a CV that that was stable and worked for you. That's huge. And then it sounded like you also did a lot of work to figure out how to ensemble both your own work and you know within your own models and then between the models yeah that's it's like a series of brilliant ideas basically um that that seemed to work did you find that you're so you, you said you had a phd in probability does that does that help with this kind of thing like i i don't so i i come <laughs> at this from a very naive perspective so what does that like how does that feed into this? Like, how does that work for you? I mean, it helps when reading papers, certainly, to have an academic background. And um, my background specifically helps, like, from understanding the concept of logits and activation functions and how you do, like, sigmoid and softmax and how you transform logits into probabilities. Mm -hmm. um, so that that certainly helps and to, to understand when it makes sense to to add logits, when it makes sense to multiply logits, all that kind of stuff um, is closely related to the uh, yeah what it, what it's meaning at the end, I would say. And then um, Koi, so you, are, it, you Christoph mentioned that you had a very strong like early base. Well, there's a strong early baseline, but you had a strong early model basically that made you uh, catch you on Christoph's radar basically. <laughs> um, <laughs> Like what? What was that? Do Do you remember what that was? I think it was um, very close to the one in the presentation. I think I got oh. uh, near optimal, uh, near optimal solution very early on. Yeah, that, that's what the composition is about. I think best fitting he got uh, he got stuck like, in a, a very high score for a very long time, mm -hmm. and everyone got um, got that feeling. So you, you feel like you basically had like a, a close to optimal like token level solution, and then it was yeah, kind I of. Think, uh, yeah, I think I'm six Tucker. He he released a baseline. I think it was very very close. Anyway, uh, I I just improved it a, a little bit with my beamsters, mm. and that's it. And then and then so this was kind of the magic mix was, uh, you having a very excellent uh, token level baseline, or uh, token level model to work with, and then Christoph bringing in a character level model. That's a really just like fascinating set of like. Uh, work and insights and just like great work. 